Good morning and welcome to St Audits, everybody. Good My name morning. Is <laughs> and I am Jody, and we are so excited to be here with you this morning. Yeah, welcome back for those of you who might be returning. Again, we're here at 9.50, 10 minutes before the service, for you guys to get some exclusive content behind the scenes and also just to feel a little bit more involved as we get ready for another wonderful Sunday service. And we loved hanging out with you guys last week. We loved interacting with you guys, commenting, seeing you guys interact with one another. And so if you're watching here this morning, please do comment. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, share about who you are and where you're watching from. And uh, do, we'd love to see some names popping on up in the comments. It's just here, so just do say like hi. Last week, yeah, last week it was great to meet some people, wasn't it? Like Alison, it was great to meet here from Sergio. You. Big Margaret, up, Sergio. Yeah. <laughs> Margaret and the other Margaret as well, yes. and Sam and all his family in Italy. Chloe, Tom, Hugo, Emily, all of you guys. That it's, is amazing memory. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's wonderful to see you guys getting involved in the chat, interacting with each other, John as well, and just yeah, having a good time. It was but great. We have, and we had some prayer requests and things popping yeah. off as well. So, guys, do be chatting to us and to each other in the chat today. We'd love it. Again, guys, we are so grateful for the requests you guys send in and also your feedback. It was some lovely, some lovely words that we heard. And, again, it makes us feel like this is worthwhile. But it also helps us to know that what we're doing for your benefit is actually benefiting you. Yeah. So please do keep getting in contact and letting us know how best we can help serve you in this time. Absolutely. And so today uh, we will be continuing in our Jesus series, looking at who Jesus is, his character, and how we as his followers can emulate him. And so I hear we're in for a bit of a treat today, right? I'm sure that we are. I mean, we often are, most Sundays, <laughs> <laughs> except the, <laughs> the time that you might see one of us preaching. But other than yeah. that, <laughs> wonderful times. But we would love to hear from you guys. Um, we'd, we want to ask you a question, basically, of what is the thing that is most intriguing about Jesus. Mm. So whether you're a seasoned follower and you've been following your whole life or whether you're here and you're like, I don't really know Jesus. I wouldn't call myself a Christian or a churchgoer. I've just found myself here on the back of a doom scroll on YouTube or <laughs> on the back of an invitation from a friend. Uh, the question still remains the same of what is the most intriguing thing about Jesus? Mm. Dits, if I were to ask you what is the most intriguing thing about Jesus, what would you say? I think there are many things that come to mind. Once someone asked me quite recently, what's the most interesting thing about Jesus? I said that he's multifaceted. And they said that that was a cop-out answer. <laughs> so I've got to do better than that this time. But I think the most intriguing thing to me is that he was fully human and fully God. And Someone explain that one. I know. How does that, how does that make sense? How can you be fully two things? Well, I'm not even you... fully English and fully Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> if you do want to know the question, the answer to that question, uh, Simon spoke about it last week. So you can check out our live stream. He touched on that quite a lot, actually. Um, so do look back on our YouTube channel or Spotify or wherever you find uh, your streaming services. Um, but today we have got some another great speaker, um, but also last week, right, at the 6 p.m. Yeah, last week. So sometimes we have the same speaker speak all through the full service on Sunday. But also here at St. Audits, we love to see new speakers raised up and new preachers. I know Jody's given a couple of strong preachers, actually. Forget what I said earlier. That one on YouTube. Right, please do. <laughs> <laughs> but also last week at the 6 p.m. service, we heard from Shauna K. Tucker. And she was speaking from John chapter 11, which, of course, has the famous verse in 35. The shortest verse. The shortest verse in the Bible. We're not going to spoil it for you. You guys can tell it to us down in the comments. But we're also going to clock to a little clip of the speak that the talk that she had last week, so you guys can hear what you missed out on last week. In John 11, 33 to 38, we see the humanity of Jesus repeatedly in such a striking way. He sees Mary weeping. He sees the hopelessness of the crowds. He sees the effects of sin and death in this world. And twice he's described as being deeply moved and troubled in spirit, angry with the state of things, but he doesn't stop there. Among these verses, perhaps the most striking is John 11:35. Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, grammatically simplistic, yet carrying remarkable weight, significance, and complexity. Jesus, God with us, wept. I am so thankful that this verse is in the Bible. 
in some of the darkest seasons that I've walked through, I've drawn so much hope from the fact that Jesus himself wept. Jesus himself understands. Despite knowing who he was and what he would do, that with two words he would snatch Lazarus back from the grave, despite being in full control of the situation, Jesus steps into the shoes of his friends, empathizes with their weakness and weeps. He weeps for the pain that they walked through in those four days when he didn't show up. But probably more than anyone else in that scene, Jesus is able to empathize. He's able to step into those shoes. He weeps and he groans in his spirit because he knows the cup that awaits him in just a few days from this point. That he himself will sweat drops of blood, asking the Father to take this cup from him. These are real tears, not a lack of faith, but tears of compassion and sorrow. Shauna was absolutely amazing. And so we hope you caught that clip from last week. And if you want to hear the full talk, you can find that on YouTube uh, or Spotify or wherever you catch your streaming services from. You can find all of our past talks on there. And talking of great talks, uh, <laughs> Dittier, how's it going? <laughs> Yeah, this isn't Dittier. This is the wonderful Laura Gallagher, who will be speaking to us today at all four services. Yeah, that's right. Here I am with my coffee. Fueling Start the day. up, ready to go. <laughs> Absolutely. It's great to have you guys. Uh, Good you to with be us here, today. Jodes. Yeah. And Good to see you, everybody. <laughs> all, of, all of your loyal fans. Say hi to mum and dad. <laughs> um, so, Laura, today, actually, before that, before yeah. that, if you didn't know, Laura has like this weird kind of. Um, uh, you've got kids in the background That's my too. Kids yeah. laughing here. <laughs> so you have two affiliations, two great affiliations. You're here in the in England, living in yeah. England. Oxford is England. Yeah, yeah. But, but how do you? But, but do you like England? Or? <laughs> I love England. It's where I've lived for many years. I don't know what you're getting at, Jodie. Uh, well, so yesterday, obviously, I don't know if you're you're a bit of a rugby fan. I don't know if you guys are rugby fans. We came, sadly, to a bit of a heartbreaking crash out of yeah, the World Cup. But sad times. We got further than Wales. That's true. And I wondered if that was where this was going. Um, yes, I grew up in... Wales, um, very committed to being Welsh. Although my accent is not as committed anymore. It's there slightly, but... Um, I've got a good joke for you, though. What about Wales? Well, you, you can't ruin it. But oh, it's sorry. Like, how do you get two whales in the car? I don't know, Jodes. How do you get two whales in the car? You get in the car and drive west. Uh, That's so bad. Anyway, anyway, Laura, can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be yeah. speaking on today? <laughs> <laughs> oh, from the ridiculous. Um, <laughs> Um, so today we are looking, still part of this series, looking at who Jesus is, uh, looking at Jesus as passionate and peaceful. And we're looking at that moment where Jesus clears the temple, where he goes in and he upends the tables and how that actually leads to our peace. Um, it's a really interesting um, aspect of who Jesus is, that kind of paradox of passionate, peaceful and what that means for our lives. So yeah, looking forward to unpacking that throughout the day. <laughs> it's really exciting. And so do stay tuned and also send this link to a friend that might um, perhaps need a little bit of peace in their life yeah. or want to know a little bit more about what it means to be passionate uh, for Jesus or for their work or their context, wherever they are. Um, and so just now before actually, uh, we'd love it. Could you pray for us on the stream before you go? Oh, yeah, that would be a joy. I'd love to pray. So Lord, we thank you for this day, uh, for your love for us, your great love for us, for your peace that we can know. Jesus, you are our peace. And we pray that we would know that afresh. Lord, would you meet with everyone who's joining on the live stream? Would they know your peace? Would they know your grace? Would they know your presence with them? Would we know your presence with us, Lord, wherever we are today? In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And so guys, we'll be back here uh, at various points throughout the service, so do stick with us. But just now we're going to go to the room and we'll see you back here very shortly.
Good morning, St Aldates. It's wonderful to see you on this half-term weekend. Thank you so much for being here. My name's Mark and I'm on team. Good morning. It's so good to see you guys here. We thank God for you all. I'm Sakina. I'm on the student team. If you are a student, please do come and find me after. It'd be so good to say hey. A little later, Laura Gallagher, our postgrads pastor, is going to be bringing us the word of God. But right now, we're going to begin in worship. So can I invite you to stand? And Sakina is going to lead us in prayer. Jesus, we just want to give you the rush of this morning. We want to give you the cares or the burdens of this week. And we just ask you to open our hearts, Lord. We thank you that you are a God who hears us. Um, and we just pray that in this time of worship that you'll be present, open the eyes of our hearts and let our praise, let your praise be our anthem, Lord. We're so excited to be in your house and we just surrender this entire morning to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We'd love to invite all the children to come to the front and help lead us in our first song. Well, thank you for joining in. We are going to invite Dan and Joy and their girls to lead us together in prayer. So let's remain standing as we pray together. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, our children have written a prayer, so I hope you'll indulge us in reading it out for you. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all of our families. Thank you for our school days. We pray that the mornings aren't cold, but warm so we don't have to wear our dressing gowns. Thank you for our teachers. We pray for people who don't have enough money. And thank you for ice cream. Amen. Say amen. Let's continue in prayer. Father, we thank you for our schools and our teachers. 
We pray that this half-term week would be a time of rest and refreshments for teachers, parents and children alike. We pray that the weather would allow for families to be outdoors and that the break from routine would be a blessing to all. In your name we pray. As we look to the Middle East, to Ukraine and to other parts of the world, we see war, terror and displaced people. In ourselves, we are lost for answers and often struggle to even engage with the sheer scale of the destruction. So we turn to you, Father, and pray, bring your peace. We turn to you, Father, and pray for our leaders, give them wisdom in their words and actions. We turn to you, Father, and pray, bring comfort to those who are suffering now. Amen. Amen. Thanks for leading us. Well, do take a seat. Just a couple of really quick notices from me. It is our light party next Saturday. If you'd like to get involved and come and help, do talk to me. There are only eight tickets left. So if you're planning to sign up, do do that. And this morning, it's really exciting. We've got some all-together worship happening. So just listen up. There's a few room changes. If you're in school years three and four... Head to the Story Museum as normal, but then please could you pick your children up from the Christopherum? And if you're in schools uh, years one and two, come to the Christopherum straight away right now and uh, you'll be picked up from there as well. And do pray as we ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill our children. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Rachel. Great. And so let's just think about our things which are coming up. Sakina, what have we got? So a week on Wednesday, we have Arise, which is our monthly worship and prayer meeting. It will be starting at 7.30 p.m. And I just want to really encourage you guys to go. I went to my first one last month, and it was just really powerful to have an extended time of worship, but also to just join as the body of Christ and contend for our church, our city, the world. Um, So yeah, would encourage you to come. That's on the 1st of November. So yeah, a week on Wednesday. Fantastic. And then uh, in just over a week, our two discipleship pathways for the rest of the term will be beginning. Good ground, that's for you if you've been following Jesus for a relatively short time or indeed are still exploring faith. Or break ground if you've been traveling with Jesus for longer, but you'd really love to go deeper. And to that end, we've got two welcome evenings coming up for good ground tomorrow evening on Monday and then break ground on Tuesday. These are evenings where you can find out about these discipleship tracks. You can meet the mentors, hear them interviewed and get a strong sense of the program. We'd love to invite you to those. If you want to find out more details, venue, 7.30, you can go to the website and uh, look at alldates.org forward slash discipleship alldates.org forward slash discipleship. Also, just to say that this Thursday, we've got a theology evening in the Christopher Room over in our church centre at 7.30, and we're really looking forward to hearing from Bishop Graham Tomlin. He's coming to give a talk, and uh, do uh, come to that if you're interested in theology, you'd like to go deeper in the Bible this Thursday, 7.30. Right now, we're going to take a moment for the children to go to the groups, and younger youth, and for us to turn and check out how our weeks have been. Are we going off? off. Okay, lovely. (laughs) Welcome back, guys. It is great to have you guys, and it is so good to see some of you saying hi, telling us where you're watching from. Do keep the comments coming in, and we'd also love to hear from you of what is the most intriguing thing about Jesus, whether you're still getting to know him, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, or whether you've been following him for all your life. What is the most intriguing thing about Jesus? Do pop the answer to that. We'd love to hear some of your thoughts. Now, Joe, you made me answer that earlier, but what is the most intriguing thing that you find about Jesus? Oh, right. I didn't know the question was going to swing back around. Um, I think for me, when I first became a Christian, I thought it was a bit boring. I thought God was very boring. Um, It was very legalistic. And so then a few years ago, I remember reading the Gospels for the first time and seeing that Jesus loved to party. He loved to eat and drink with his friends um, and people that he was ministering to. So for me... I think the most intriguing thing is that Jesus is a bit of a party boy. Nice. (laughs) It's actually quite true, you know, it's first miracle. Anyway, well, 
We hope that you guys can continue getting in contact with us in the chat. But right now, it looks like the band are about to get ready to worship. So let's get ready to worship together in your living room, wherever you are. Yeah, let's stand on your feet and have a bit of a dance to this one. So (laughs) we'll see you guys soon.
See things like you do, God, I look to you. 
Lord, thank you for your great kindness. Thank you that you are so kind that when we were far off, you drew near. You drew so close to us. And thank you that you won us back into the love of the Father, into relationship with him into a never-ending adventure of relationship with our Father in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for each one of us and where we are on that journey of relationship with our Father in heaven. We thank you for the adventure of it. We thank you for the joy and the abundance that comes in it. And we pray, Lord, that you would increase our faith this morning. We pray for an increase of faith, Lord, in the room. We pray, Lord, that each one of us would press in deeper to you, further up and further in. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for worshipping with us. Would you like to take a seat? You'll know that we're currently in a sermon series. We're looking at different aspects of Jesus' character. And to that end, uh, we're going to hear now from uh, somebody in our church talking about her relationship with Jesus. This is Lauren. I remember a time in my life where I had walked away from Jesus and I was looking for my identity and partying and in who people said I am and my social status and how cool I was. But when I came back to Jesus, the fact that he said to me, you know, you are, you are mine, you are made new in me, that really gave me a a new identity and I I don't need to look anywhere else apart from other than who Jesus says I am Um, and I'm confident in who I am because I know that he lives in me and that gives me such a confidence because I know that it's not just not just me but it's it's Jesus in me living and breathing through me and every decision I make every conversation I have it's not just me on my own it's it's Jesus speaking speaking through me because when you invite Jesus into your life he comes into every part of your life and the Holy Spirit comes in comes into your heart and, and lives there and you've, he's got a permanent home in you and in me. <laughs> Lauren is one of our undergrad pastors along with Aidan who's just been leading us in worship. And if you haven't met Lauren yet, if you're an undergrad, do say hello to her when you see her around. Now we're really excited in a moment. Laura Gallagher, our postgrads pastor, one of them is going to come and preach to us. But first of all, Sakina is going to bring us the word. Morning. Um, Today's reading is from Matthew 21, verse 12 to 17. That's Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 to 17. Okay. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out to the city, went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be with you this morning, those of you in here and those joining us online. 
I wonder, when was the last time that you were aware that something really mattered to you? Maybe it's at the moment you're in the middle of a really important project at work, you know it's going to do real good for your organisation, or maybe the last thing that you were aware really mattered to you was an important conversation with a family member or a friend. Some of us are people pleasers and we try to go through life uh, trying not to make any disturbance. You know, we accommodate the strong ones. We anticipate the reaction of the prickly ones. We read the room and we uh, keep the peace. Uh, we uh, avoid conflict. Who are my fellow conflict avoiders in the room or watching online? Yeah, I, I see you, I see you. Uh, but even for us, there are things that really matter. <laughs> matter enough to cause us um, to forego the sort of lack of awkwardness, to cause a bit of a scene, to disturb the peace. I used to be a high school teacher, which I think is part of why I was a bit hesitant to do what I did a few weeks ago. I arranged a meeting with one of our kids' teachers to talk about something I wasn't very happy about. Experience has taught me that when it comes to their kids, parents can be a bit biased. And um, I didn't want to be naive to that. Um, but there are some things in life that matter to us that we are moved, sometimes quite literally moved to action. And in this passage that was just read to us from Matthew's Gospel, we see what mattered to Jesus. There are lots of passages in the Bible that show us what Jesus cared about, where we see what mattered to him. But here are Jesus's actions that make a particular statement. And he's stating a few things. He's stating in this moment in the temple as he upends the table that a new day of worship has come in and through him. And he's stating God's judgment on that which is out of line with good and perfect rule and reign of God's kingdom. But we're looking at this passage in Matthew 21 through a particular lens today, as we're carrying on this series, looking at Jesus and what we might at first think are these kind of paradoxes. We've been looking at Jesus's strength and weakness, looking at Jesus as someone who redefines failure and success, as Jesus is someone who's challenging and completely kind. And today we're looking at Jesus as passionate, and peaceful. Jesus is passionate and peaceful. Jesus didn't do superficial smoothing over of things. Jesus wasn't a people pleaser. He wasn't afraid to speak truth to power. And yet he was a bringer of peace in situation after situation, offering forgiveness, extending healing wherever he went, bringing peace. When he sends out the 72, those people who are going to go with this message of God's goodness and his kingdom. We can read about it in Luke's gospel, chapter 10. He instructs them specifically to share peace with the villages and towns that they go to. Jesus is passionate and peaceful. And the first thing that we see in our passage this morning is that Jesus is passionate and compassionate. So imagine the scene with me for a moment here in Matthew 21. Jesus goes into the temple. That's the place where God's people gathered as a community to worship. That's where they'd come and they bring their offering. That's why the animals are there. They're named in the passage and they bring their uh, Roman coinage to be exchanged for temple coinage. That's the money tables that are mentioned. And Jesus has just come into the temple. The crowds have been worshiping. Uh, realizing who he is, shouting, Hosanna, God saves. Here is Jesus coming into the temple. And it's the place where he's found as a 12-year-old boy, teaching truths about who God is. And he goes into that place and overgo the tables and the chairs and the money hits the deck. We read in verse 12, Jesus entered the temple and he drove out all who sold and brought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Here we see Jesus move to action. His passion moves him to action. Jesus here is turning things upside down in order to turn them the right way up. That's what Jesus is committed to in our lives and in our world, the turning of things the right way up. 
He upends the tables here so that the fullness of God's kingdom, his glory, his goodness, true worship can be experienced and known. He upends the tables as a statement that any injustice that is going on in the money lenders, that that was not okay. And he upends the tables to say that any kind of thinking in temple system that was going to be about a revolution and overcoming the Roman Empire by brute force, well, that was not okay. But he mainly overturns these tables to make a statement as he temporarily halts the sacrificial system. As it's all over the floor there, no one for a moment can bring any sacrificial offerings, what they would do to know access with the glorious presence of God. And in that moment, Jesus is saying, look, a new day has dawned in me. I'm the sacrificial lamb. You come through me, access to the Father who loves you, the fullness of the presence of God. And so here Jesus is turning things upside down to turn them the right way up. You know, Jesus doesn't meet with us this morning as someone who's like not all that bothered, who kind of shrugs his shoulders, is impassive, cold, nothing really matters. And that's a good thing because here is God in a person, God in the flesh, And he cares, he cares. We don't worship a stone cold stoic or a zoned out Zen. Our God is dedicated to things being as they should be. His heart's broken when they're not. He is stirred by injustice. He is moved with compassion. He judges when the glory and goodness of God is grieved. And Jesus is the perfect sinless son of God. And so we're to understand this moment as a demonstration of his perfect passion for the glory of God and of his compassion to others. We see that in our passage. Have a look in verse 14, where we read that the blind and the lame, they came to him in this moment, just after he's overturned the tables, they came to him and he heals them. Time and time again throughout the Gospels, we see that there are these moments in the text where just before Jesus does something, it says that Jesus is stirred with compassion. Before he feeds that hungry crowd in Matthew 14, the text says that he's moved with compassion. Just before our passage here in Matthew 21, two blind men come to him and the text says that Jesus is moved with compassion and he reaches out and touches them. It must have been the most beautiful thing to spend time with someone as passionately compassionate as Jesus. You know, in the original language, that word compassion that's used to describe Jesus just before he heals, just before he acts, that word in the original language means like a stirring in your guts. I love that. Jesus feels it so deeply. He's stirred with compassion. I wonder, have you ever had that experience? I love that about Jesus. I don't want a God who isn't bothered or a God who remains detached. I don't want a stone cold stoic or a zoned out Zen. No, Jesus is passionate. He is compassionate. When I was six, I was on holiday with my family and you could go pony trekking where you have a little ride around on a horse. Um, I'd never done this before. I was soon to learn I would never do this again. (laughs) And I was, I convinced my parents to pay the cash that I could join around seven other kids on the backs of these little uh, ponies. There was an instructor who was going to take us through the stables and into an open field and it was all going really well it was wonderful little six-year-old Laura was loving this moment and my dad was just a couple of feet away and then I don't know what happened something must have frightened this horse I was on and all of a sudden this horse is cantering down the stables right toward this open field at a fast pace with me clinging onto the reins crying out uh, Not much of that had passed before my dad is also running after us. And the instructor, who's the professional here, is shouting after my dad, stop, you'll just make it worse, you'll make the pony go faster. But my dad was not going to take that risk. And my dad's pretty fast. (laughs) Little did he know all of his medals in athletics in high school and university were actually all just for this moment in his life. (laughs) He's actually still 
pretty fast. I'd, I'd probably still back him to outrun that pony. Um, <laughs> eventually, my, uh, my dad reaches me on this horse in this field now. He grabs a hold of the reins and he takes a hold of me and everything is okay. Passion and commitment, dedication can be very right. It can be a very beautiful thing. And there's a passion at work in this world, in the love of God our Father, that is beautifully dedicated and relentlessly committed to you, like a chasing after us. And there's a passion at work in this world, a commitment of God to the, his glory, to the fulfillment of his good, perfect kingdom, a call to true worship. That's what's going on here in Matthew 21. So passionate dedication to us and to the glory of God. And you see those two things hold together. For when the glory of God is honoured and known in our lives and in our world, then our lives are most as they should be. Eugene Peterson, the American pastor and theologian who wrote the message version of the Bible, I guess he must have preached thousands of sermons. In his funeral in 2018, his son Leif said, my dad only really had one sermon. It's a little harsh. But he was saying that for 30 years, he tricked his congregation, uh, convincing them each week that he was giving them something new. And his son said in his funeral, I actually uh, knew his secret because it was a message that I had heard for 50 years. And he carried on speaking, now directing his words in the funeral to his dad. And he said this, for years, dad, you'd steal into my room at night and whisper softly to my sleeping head. It's the same message over and over. God loves you. He's on your side. He's coming after you. He's relentless. Even the best of dads, the best of parents won't have loved us with perfect commitment. And some perhaps have never known a love, anything like that. But in Jesus, the revelation to us of the love of God the Father, we see a passion that heals us, a passion that reaches us when we're off down side alleys and we're confused and it's all open fields. We see a passion and a dedication and a commitment that shows us that we are seen, that we are loved, that we are held, that we are chased after. I wonder, have you known that enduring, endless love of God. Whatever dead end, (laughs) whatever alley you find yourself, whatever danger or threat you are even in this morning, look behind you, look to your shoulder. Your Father's love is there for you. And so we see in this passage, firstly then, Jesus is passionate and he's compassionate. And secondly, we see that Jesus is rooted and rested in the peace of God, these two sides, passion and peace. Jesus isn't a stone cold stoic. There's this action, there's this passion here and it's communicating something. But we also see in Matthew 21, Jesus's priority for retreating and how he would often in his ministry withdraw in solitude, withdraw to pray, withdraw from the crowd. And we see that in verse 17 of Matthew 21, where we read, he went out of the city to Bethany, and lodged there. He left. He left the hype. He went out of the city where it had all just gone down. And he goes to Bethany. Interestingly, that's the house of his friends, his three friends. That's where they were, Lazarus and Mary and Martha. How interesting that part of Jesus' rooting and resting his peace is knowing that kind of deep companionship and friendship. And Jesus has that pattern of rooting himself throughout his ministry in the peace of God. Where do we see him do this? Well, he does it before big decisions. We read in Luke 6 that before he calls his 12 closest followers, his 12 disciples, he spends the whole night in prayer. We see this when Jesus experiences grief and loss. When he hears the news in Matthew 14 that his cousin John the Baptist has died, he retreats. We read that he steals away, that he goes. Often Jesus is seen to be going up a mountain to pray, to seek the Father, to root and rest himself in the peace of God. You see, that is where Jesus is coming from. Into these moments of passion and action and compassion and living out the purposes of God, he comes from a place of peace, of resting in the presence of God. And that's what he wants to establish 
for us. Because you see, for us to live in the purposes of God, as Jesus fully did, then we need both passionate action and prayerful contemplation. Because we can, can't we, have both a right and a wrong passion. It's interesting that in our passage this morning, Jesus' passionate action is directly contrasted with the indignation, the passion, the riledness, the riling of the chief priests and the scribes, those leaders within the temple. Have a look in verse 15, where we see that the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna! to the son of David. And what does it say? It says that they were indignant. They're annoyed. They're angry. And the text tells us that two things tick them off. The wonderful things Jesus did and the children crying out in the temple. They are not on board with Jesus's priority for humility. That in Jesus's ministry, it would actually often be, as Jesus would say, not the great and mighty that would see who he is, but the humble the children, and adding a little extra passion to what he's saying, Jesus directly quotes from the Old Testament scripture that these chief priests and scribes should have known, quoting from Psalm 8 here in our passage saying, out of the mouths of infants and children, God has ordained praise. But I also think that what's going on here for these chief priests and scribes is that they are just a bit jealous of Jesus. The text says they didn't like the wonderful things that he did. How often in our lives can our indignation or our passion actually just be a form of envy or because we feel insecure? Jesus didn't massage their egos here and irritatingly at times, he won't massage ours. And so how do you know if your passions are misplaced? How do you know if you're in a right kind of passion or a wrong kind of passion? Well, the question is, are you rooted? Are you rested in the peace of God? You know, we might feel like something really matters and we really have to speak up and the moment is really now, but our passions can be led by all sorts of things. By fear, that can be a big one. By aspiration, to get ahead, a striving. Maybe by embarrassment. But the question to us is, is our feeling rooted in the foundation of the peace of God? And for our passions to be ordered rightly, we have to seek those moments of retreat, of prayer, so we're more aware of the empowering presence and the peace that the Holy Spirit brings. You know those big feels we have? We've got to weigh them and pray them. Blaise Pascal said that all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. That sounds wonderful to me. (laughs) Actually, this summer, I felt like I rediscovered a kind of fresh love for prayer. It wasn't that I had stopped praying, but I read a couple of books on prayer in the summer, and Owen, my husband, and I, we were reassessing our patterns of prayer at home, and Actually, a lot of this came out of some hard stuff that happened in the summer where prayer, retreating, being in the presence of God, rooting and rested in his peace as Jesus does here in our passage, that was just a lifeline for me. In August, a very close friend of mine died and then another very close friend received a diagnosis and I remember saying to my husband Owen one day, how do we do all of this without prayer? (laughs) Let's not. And we're all finding ourselves, I'm sure, as we watch the news and we see our war-torn world stirred to pray, God, would you move? Would you bring your peace? How we need you, Lord. But you know, October is like racing away for me. And I can so quickly pivot into such a fast-paced life. You know, we prize ourselves, don't we, living in like a fast-paced life. So I don't know what it is for you, but maybe it's that we're dropping the kids off to school whilst firing off a few emails on our phone, looking up occasionally to test them on on their spellings. And then we're dressed in our gym gear because we're headed to a class at 9 a.m. Before that, though, we got to drop off a parcel at the post office and uh, we're going to join a call whilst we're driving with work on our hands free. (laughs) Living that kind of fast-paced life. I actually feel like the end of this passage 
(laughs) speaking directly to me, leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany. Because you know, the distance from the city to Bethany is actually exactly the same distance from the city here to where we live in Headington. (laughs) And so I'm asking myself, and I wonder, what about you this morning? What places in our lives and what people too, like for Jesus here in Bethany, what places and what people give us the margin in our lives that we need so that we can be those who don't just overreact or or not even those who just act, but those who act in the empowering presence and peace of God in our lives where we're operating out of that place of being rooted and rested in his peace. What does a life like that look like? I think of my friend. She, many years ago, studied social work at Brooks here in the university here. And she had this passion for young people, especially those perhaps who the education system wasn't working for, maybe also for young offenders. And uh, she actually was made redundant in 2011. And in that moment, she realized that the funding for the people she was working with, these young people was gonna be cut as her job was cut. And so with another guy in the city, someone part of another local church here, I remember them coming to me and praying with me because they had this idea, why not start up a charity that can reach out to these people in Oxfordshire and now today, their dedication, their commitment, their passion has meant that 3,500 young people and their families and professionals, teaching professionals in schools, have had the benefit and support of the work that they do. See, that's a kind of passion rooted in the peace, rested in the peace of God. I think of my friend Marina, a musician in Ukraine. She spent a lot of the last couple of years, meeting in in rooms without electricity, with other Christians, gathering to pray, gathering to root herself in the peace of God. And actually in 2014, the beginnings of this war were starting to break out. She took her violin, a professional musician, to play to soldiers on the front line, to play there and to take with her gospels about Jesus, so that through the beauty of her playing, she might have the opportunity to speak of hope in him. A passion, a gifting, rooted and established in the peace of God. You know, as I was praying for us this morning, I had this sense from the Lord that there might be those of us who need that renewed sense of God's vocation. A passion perhaps he's placed in your life, something he's called you to, something to be committed to, a a, a calling, a gifting that maybe today by the work of his spirit, he wants to renew in you. And so we see then that Jesus is passionate and compassionate, that he has this practice of being rooted and established in the peace of God. And then finally, we see here that Jesus's passion is our peace. In verse 13, Jesus says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. He's quoting there from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. And for the Old Testament people of God, the temple was this place of prayer. This temple was this place of heaven meeting earth where they could come into the presence of God. And they would come with their hearts and their lives and their offerings and their sacrifices and encounter the peace and the presence of God. In John's account of this moment where Jesus goes into the temple and overturns the tables, we read this. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken, here's their indignation, uh, 46 years to build this temple and you are gonna raise it in three days? And then verse 21 says, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. Matthew here, in his account, puts this moment just days before Jesus would go to the cross, where his body would be given for us and then would be raised three days later. And Jesus in this moment is saying that he, he is the new location of the very presence of God. He's the temple in him. He's this epicenter of heaven and earth. And he is the sacrificial lamb. 
You see, there would, after this moment in Matthew's gospel, in just a few days' time, be something that Jesus goes through that, interestingly, we actually call his passion, his death, the passion of Christ, his suffering, uh, from that Latin word to suffer, his passion. And so as Jesus, in his passion, as he dies for us, offering us forgiveness, taking us in to the very presence and life and fullness and glory of God as we take a hold of his hand. We are welcomed into everlasting peace because Jesus' passion is for our peace, that ultimate peace, that peace of knowing forgiveness, that peace of knowing our purpose, that peace of knowing we are loved, that peace come what may in our lives this morning. He is with us. He is for us. He is chasing after us. He is with us by his spirit. Paul, St. Paul in the New Testament writing to the church in Ephesus says this in Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, and actually Mark mentioned this just a moment ago, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Jesus' passion is for our peace, peace with God and peace with others. When I was uh, 25 and I was working here as the pastor to undergrads, um, I one evening drove to Cardiff, where I'm, the area where I'd lived since I was seven, uh, to be with my parents who were contemplating because they felt God had called them a move to England, which felt very courageous not because it was England. <laughs> That's not a slight on the English. <laughs> they felt this call from God to go there and um, to lead a church there. And I remember we'd been chatting it through and we were sat in the living room. And I remember my dad praying. And he prayed that God would give them wisdom, that God would guide them, that God would speak through other people to them. And then he prayed that they would know God's peace. And then he prayed, echoing words that he'd heard from others. Lord, we know that peace is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of Christ. If we live like Jesus, lives of passion, we are not guaranteed ease. In fact, sometimes it can be because we work with him in our calling and our gifting to build his kingdom that we're actually more aware of the challenges in this world, more aware of the threats, but in and through it all, Christ, who is our peace, is with us. And one day when we see him face to face, he will overturn all the tables of evil and all that stops us fully knowing him. And we will be with him in the place where everything is as it should be, where all is turned up the right way. And so where this morning is your peace, perhaps a bit timid or loveless, and where is your passion misplaced? Get a glimpse of the fierce passion of God burning against everything that inhabits us, knowing his peace. Because of his passion, you can know peace. And as we receive that peace, would we be those who follow him? The passionate, peaceful God, the one who cares, the one who steps in. As we receive his peace, let us follow him, knowing that there are things that really matter, that there are things worth sacrificing our comfort for, worth speaking up for, worth living our lives for, worth working with him to turn things the right way up. For he is with us, the passionate, peaceful God. Amen. Would you like to stand? Okay, oh, do you need to go? Let's take a moment to invite the Holy Spirit before we worship again. And so we welcome you, Holy Spirit.
you might like to put out your hands in front of you just as a sign of an openness of heart to receive whatever it is the Lord wants to give you this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. Come across this church, Lord, we pray. Holy Spirit, thank you that you come as fire. You come as passion. You're not indifferent. Lord, we pray that you would stir our hearts with this message and make it personal to each one of us. Just as we continue to rest in the presence of God, I had a strong sense of um, uh, some of us here this morning feeling and thinking about ourselves, I wish I had more passion. I wish I had the passion of a Jesus Christ. And it's easy in discipleship, in midlife, perhaps, for our hearts just to grow somewhat cold. But I believe the Lord really wants to stir passion in our hearts again this morning. I also think that um, what Laura was saying about God calling and commissioning people in a fresh way this morning is really resonant, is really true that there are ways in which you will have felt stirred and called some of you this morning and God wants, wants to really speak into that. And then I, I sense that there are others here for whom uh, that deep peace is something that you are perhaps even desperate for this morning. You long for that peace not, as Laura said, an absence of trouble, but a fullness of Christ. And we'd love to pray for that. We'd love to pray for that fullness of Christ in your heart, even in the midst of trouble and difficulty. So I'm going to invite the, whole, uh, the prayer ministry team forward now, if you'd like to come forward. We'd love to pray for people here at the front. We're going to worship. But please, as we worship and you feel stirred, just uh, come forward and let's, um, let's have you receive prayer. Passion for a deep peace in your hearts or for anything else which is on your mind or heart this morning.
just got a a, a strong word I feel that's really uh, right for this morning yeah uh, from this morning um, such a powerful word I really felt God reminding me um, and reminding this congregation that we are his temples and that sometimes our flesh or the enemy can make us feel like we're inadequate or we're not good enough for God to dwell in us, but His Holy Spirit genuinely finds a home in us in the same way that He brought passion and peace together in His temple. It's the same way He wants to bring passion and peace together in us and use us to bring passion and peace in this world. So I just pray that we all have the boldness to bring that passion and peace, to go out and to heed His voice and to heed that spirit that dwells in us, to bring that to life, to live out, yeah, what He wants to come to pass in this world and what He wants to use us for because He's calling us to such a great mission um, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our families. Um, So yeah, Lord, we just give our hearts fully to You. We give our bodies, we give the temples that You've used us for fully to You. We surrender that so that You can use us more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to sing the last verse again before we uh, come to complete the service. But I I really sense that that the Lord wants to purify and strengthen hearts in the way that Sakina is talking about for difficult and challenging situations in families, communities, workplaces. And so if that's you, uh, let's respond, continue to respond to the Holy Spirit. Grow still and night draws me. I will not be afraid. For I know the plans He has for me. Don't finish at my grave. Sing it again when breath
Yeah, Lord, we just thank you so much that we can look to you, that you are the passion of our life. Jesus, we worship you, we exalt you. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, uh, cookies are going to come around. We'd love to invite you to stay and enjoy time together. But right now, let's receive the blessing of our Father in heaven. And so may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of day. Wow. Amen and amen. Amen. What a wonderful service. What a morning. What a morning. I loved Laura's line of we don't follow a God that is a stone cold stoic or a Zen out. So, Zoned so out, out Zen. Zen. Yeah. What a beautiful message. I wrote that down so quickly as I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have loved engaging with you guys in the comments and seeing some of your thoughts. There was the, the answer to the question of what is most intriguing about Jesus by Will. Oh man, read it out. That was beautiful. He said, most intriguing thing about Jesus is that he never ceases to amaze me in turning places of pain into beauty. He redeems. On he redeems. He Amen. Redeems. Let's get this guy preaching next Honestly, week. Honestly, <laughs> well done. Guys. It's so good to have you. It's from Germany as well. What a blessing. Wow. I hope well. you're having a wonderful time there. So good. And thank you guys so much for joining us. And we'd love to hear your reflections just now of uh, what you found most helpful or maybe a standout line like me and Dits that you enjoyed or you'll be taken away from this week. Mm. Um, and guys, we have really loved seeing your comments and we will be back here next week, right? Indeed we will. We shall be. 9.50 again in the morning. You can make it a bit more of a, <laughs> of a plan now to know that you've got to tune in 10 minutes before the service starts. There'll be some interaction with us. Yeah. We'll try and keep it fresh, see what new things we can keep going, yeah. but also just, just have it a relaxed space so we can talk to you, you guys can talk to us. We love to hear from you. Yeah, and and this morning has you, been, yeah, it's been beautiful. a show of that, yeah. And we need to make sure that you guys get a cup of tea and a coffee. That is surely the beauty of doing this from yeah, exactly. wherever you guys are. Um, but do send the links to friends that you think might uh, enjoy this talk or the worship or the entire service and do invite them next week. Um, but... Also, remember that you can catch up at any point online uh, on Spotify, on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, and you can hear all of our talks throughout the weeks. Um, but today, we have had an absolute joy with being with you guys. So thank you so much for joining. Again, if you have anything that you want to say to us and get in contact with us at the live stream, please send it to our email at communications at stalldates.org.uk. That's communications at stalldates.org.uk. And we would love to get back to you to hear your feedback. And also, if you have any prayer requests, we have a team that meet in the middle of the week. And yeah, they would love to pray for you and to just hold you up for whatever it is that you feel you'd like God to work in. And if you're here in the city at any point, do come say hi on a Sunday or you will have heard some of our announcements today of uh, Rise, our worship night and various other things. So do come say hi. We'd love to meet you. And if you are from further afield than Oxford, then we are praying a blessing over you guys and hope that you're enjoying life wherever you are. Amen. God be with you all and God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday. Goodbye. Bye guys.